two and recording mr tyler morton author of from kites to cold war just over his shoulder conveniently placed but also you will notice there is no american flag which is why oh. i have contacted the gestapo right. to, to have him and perhaps his family disciplined i i think it's only fair in a in uh, you know I'm gonna just start saying some shit that's gonna be taken out of context. So. Yeah, don't do that. Yeah, um, but yeah, dude, what's going on? Did you? I'm. Did you watch that? Did you watch the fucking? Did you watch the video with with Charlie Duke? I did. I watched. I didn't watch the whole thing. I watched part of it though, man. That's I'm, awesome. Thanks, man. I'm. I'm. I've been. I've been sending that to so many people, and just like. Yeah. I'm just like jumping down their throats. I'm like, did you watch it? He walked. Yeah. I don't know if you know this, but he walked on the moon. Did you? Yeah. He <laughs> moon. He moon. Joe Rogan. Yeah. No moonwalkers. Just saying. Right. Yeah. You know what's cool is, uh, I'm. You know, I live on Langley Air Force Base, right? Yeah. And that's uh, that's where the Mercury astronauts did all their their initial training. Yeah. Of, like all the stuff around me. Their yeah. headquarters of the early NASA's right behind me, right over here. So yeah, we started getting a little more into you know early astronauts and stuff and yeah. disney plus has that new right stuff series on which yeah is, it looks like it's been pretty cool we watched the first three episodes yeah right? so, yeah it's pretty neat it's I mean, that's I was, not what you want to talk about though what no it's not but I, yeah i was yeah I, I was just yeah i'm still in like a i'm just i'm i can't like my brain can't wrap around the fact that he walked on the moon right. just, it doesn't compute it's yeah. but yeah and then well, you followed up with with me yeah, um, I know, right? What a drop! God. I know, right? No, no, I had on. I thought I, I, I thought I did one yesterday. Yeah, I did one yesterday. <laughs> I was just like, man, David Libby. I was like, man, you just, I'm. It, no one can really follow it well. I was just like, man, someone's just walking into just yeah. footprints the size of North America. <laughs> right, I didn't realize you'd done one after that. So. You're good. There's a buffer. You're good. There's, there's a, you're yeah. clear. Because now you just got to beat David. And you just beat that episode yesterday. Hey, we're on the up and up it again. But God, man, there, no one was getting out of that one alive. You walked in after the moon. Died. Podcast should have ended. But with the moon, let's pull it back seven years. Cuban Missile Crisis, which, what is that? Yeah. 58 years ago? Right about now, right? 58 yeah. years ago. Yeah. yeah. Closest we ever came to going to nuclear war, according to some people. Do you think that was? I don't know. I've, I've studied it a lot. I've, you know, and, and the cool thing is now all the, you know, all the CIA reports and all the, you know, all the notes from, you know, within the administration are all kind of declassified. So you can, you can piece together a lot of it. And I don't know. I don't want to jump to any conclusions, but there was a lot of talk between, you know, Khrushchev and Kennedy going on pretty much the whole time. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. I don't know. It was close. It was close. I mean, the thing is, you know, in those days, a couple guys make the wrong decisions, and you know, crap just gets out of hand. And <laughs> it just takes off. You know. <laughs> Next thing you know, there's a tactical nuke being dropped. Right. That, that's the crazy part. Is yeah, and what that wasn't like live satellite uplinks and like head cam GoPros, like. Yeah. Right. That was, I mean, that was what? That was 17 years removed from World War II? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the, yeah. General, you know, General LeMay was the chief of staff of the Air Force, and he was ready. <laughs> he was, he was, uh, he was, there are several quotes from him where he's like, man, if, yeah, if we were lucky, it would have been World War III, but unfortunately we got out of it. People are just like, what, what did you say? But it's, I mean, have you ever listened to that tape of him and Kennedy talking? And he's yeah. like, he's like, well, Mr. President, you're in a, you know, you're in a, he said like, you're in a tough spot. And yeah. Kennedy was like, I believe you're here with me. But LeMay was just very much like, oh no, like, I don't care. Yeah. Like, yeah. You're in a tough spot geopolitically. Yeah. And he's like, yeah. yeah. I mean, you got to remember who LeMay was, right? I mean, he yeah. was, he was born in battle, literally. I mean, yeah. That guy, that guy was born to be a bomber guy. I mean, yeah. He, he took care of everything in England and then he flew over to Japan and took care of them too. I mean, yeah. he was the bomber guy. That was just life. I mean, yeah. He was brutally efficient at it. I mean, yeah. you know, he's, he, he said multiple times, you know, if, if we had lost, I'd have been tried as a war criminal. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And I mean, he had, yeah, he had some great quotes about, uh, about warfare. I mean, that's a, that's a stupid statement. He had some great quotes about excessive force and the importance of it yeah yeah use it I think, we, I think we talked about it one time before you know yeah 
we were bom- we were firebombing the crap out of Tokyo. I mean, yeah. we had destroyed that city way more than you know than the, than the two bombs did and, and the, the nuclear bombs did. I mean, it, I mean that. I mean, not that you know getting nuked isn't bad either, but yeah, you, you know, having your city destroyed by fire. That's, yeah, that ranks up there with you know pretty shitty way to die, right? Oh yeah, I mean the reason why in a in O'Reilly's book, uh, Killing the Rising Sun. Apparently, the reason why the firebombing stopped was because we ran through all of our munitions. We ran out of napalm. Yeah, we. It wasn't. It wasn't that America was let. Lemay was like, we don't have any more. No, we used it all. I mean, that's yeah. true. I mean, yeah, that, yeah. That is that is that's actually what happened. Like, no yeah. meme, no joke aside. That yeah. that's what yeah. happened. Yeah. Yeah, we were they, were, they were deep into, I can't remember which book it was, but they were deep into, you know, getting, you know, the production ramped back up so they could have more, but yeah, we ran out. Yeah. <laughs> we're laughing about it like it's funny. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it was terrible, but. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, yeah, I mean, 85 million people dead, there's obviously nothing to laugh about, but I mean, I also think that there's something to be said for, you got to put a, you got to put a, a tint of humor on things because it makes it more digestible. But it, and it was total war. I mean, yes, it, it, it's like, it's, yes, it's total yeah, war. It like, was, come on. It was the one example in our history of total war where everything went no holds barred and, and, the, and the guys actually thought they were fighting for their very existence, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. the, the world was, was at risk of going one way or another. You know, would, would, you, would you say that, would you say that World War One was total war? I, no, I, it's it's hard for me to say it was total war, right? Because you know the the entire industrial mar- might of the United States wasn't marshaled. Okay. You know the the there yes it was spread out all over the world. I mean there was there was fighting going on everywhere, but it, it was not mass killing on the scale of World War II everywhere, right? Mm-hmm. I mean you know whole world front lines in France, Belgium, absolutely miserable, terrible. Yeah, but that was really the you know that was where most of that terribleness was happening, right? I mean, okay, okay. And, you know, you could you could be in America in 1917 and not be affected by the war in Europe. That's true. You could not be in America in 1944 and not be affected by the World War. Yeah, you would. Right? You'd be working in a factory, or you you'd would be doing something, you or know? you were drafted. You would be doing it right if you were, you know, capable. You'd be over there. If yep. you were not capable, you'd be doing something to support the cause, or you'd be yeah. sacrificing in one way or another, right? Yeah. Whatever that, whatever that would have been. So yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't put those two things in the same category at all. Yeah. And if you think about the millions and millions of people worldwide that died in World War II, not military folks, right? Yeah. Fucking you know, like all yeah. the, you know. All the Holocaust, all the all the Russians that were killed, and yeah. all, all of the murder, the Chinese that, that died, you know. I mean, all the Japanese civilians and the fire bombings. Yeah, I mean, just yeah, that's that's a scale we hopefully will never be at again. So that's, yeah. yeah, World War yeah, World War Two is that, that's one thing that's always kind of always I guess stopped in my mind. Something I've always paused on. I mean, I remember thinking about it in high school. Was that's the only time ever that yeah. There was no holds barred. Everyone went at it. Everyone threw. We came out bell wrong. We came out with haymakers. Yep. And we threw the best things we had. There was no, you know, mutually assured destruction. There was a breakneck race for yep. newts. And then right. when it worked, the morning of July 16th, 1945, after the test worked, that's the morning we started shipping pieces to Tinian Island. I mean, yep. it worked. Right. Ground zero is still hot. And they were like, go. And then we drop them. It's... There's never been anything like that, and I don't think there ever can be again. Well, we, we hope not, right? Yeah. Well, that's. We that's, hope not. But, but, but yeah, I mean, that's a good example of just how desperate the situation was. Yeah. You know, how, how, you know, we talked about it before. To save lives, they had to do what they did. Yes. Right? Because the casualty numbers that it would have taken to actually take Japan, the mainland, would have been astronomical mm-hmm. nobody nobody wanted to do that yeah i mean that's a good reflection of just how desperate it was and how you know what steps you will go to 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 end something that was as bad as that was yeah right yeah yeah it's and yeah it's because now i mean every war since then there's always been the option of nuclear and it's been avoided so it's never been all out nothing you know 
Cold War inched towards it, but it didn't do it. So to bring that to the Cuban Missile Crisis, yeah, what what was the role of ISR in that? I mean, I know like I actually don't know enough. I don't know as much about the Cuban Missile Crisis as I probably should. Yeah, I mean, you 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 probably should know more about it, right? Yeah, you know. So if you put it in you know in the whole context of what was going on in the world, right? Mm -hmm. It's so we're. 15, I mean, let's call it 1960, right? So that's you know, really kind of when everything starts, right after, you know, Castro decides that he's going to declare, you know, the Cuban government to be a socialist government. Um, so you're 15 years after, you know, the end of World War II. Um, so that's 15 years of, of the Cold War, right? right. And, and, you know, by the end of World War II, the Americans and the, and the Russians and Soviets, we already know that that's going to be, you know, that's going to be the future, right? There, there's no doubt. So, you know, we, we put our differences aside for a few years to, to defeat Hitler and the Japanese, but everyone knows, you know, that it's going to be going to be a thing between Soviets and, and Americans. So, you know, Russia is, is utterly decimated at the end of World War II, right? I mean, you know, keep that in mind, right? Mm -hmm. The United States is the only superpower, right, you know, when the war ends. Yeah. We have the nukes. We have this huge industrial base in the United States that's just churning and churning and keeps churning, right? You know, even after, you know, we, we turn into an economic boom right after the war and things are awesome in America. In Russia, millions and millions of people died, civilians, mm -hmm. all over the place. The economy is shattered. You know, their land is destroyed because there, you know, there was war in Russia, right? Yeah. And the Germans made it a pretty yeah. fair piece into into Russia. Yeah, Barbarossa. So we're in we're in kind of complete opposite ends when the Cold War starts. But what happens in 1950? Right? They get the nuke. Yeah. That that kind of changes everything, right? So they're slowly climbing out of it. But the nuke kind of, I mean, you know, in my mind, kind of calms things down a little. The Russian nuke kind of calms things down, right? Because now there's there's a counterbalance. Yeah. So we can't we can't be as dominant as as we want to be. But if you think about it, you know, America is the only country after World War II that has the strength and the power to project troops around the world. Yes. Right. So that's when you start seeing American bases in Germany, American bases in Turkey, America, all around the periphery of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. The United States is either has allies or has actually actual bases sitting around that country. And that's yeah. obviously, you know, something that's going to not be awesome for the premieres of the Soviet Union, right? Um, so 1959, uh, you know, a rebel in Cuba who was tired of being under the thumb of his government, you know, the Batista regime, overthrows that government and sides with the Soviets. And that's an opportunity. I mean, yeah. You think, you think the Russians really cared about Fidel Castro? No. no. Location, location, location. Location, 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 right? Yeah. So the Americans have nuclear weapons in Turkey, mm -hmm. sitting right outside of Russia, right outside, certainly within striking distance of multiple strategic targets all around, right? So ground launch nuclear weapons. The Russians see Cuba as an opportunity. Um, you know, the, 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 the declassified documents say that the, you know, the offer and the real, you know, the real thought to put nuclear weapons on the island didn't actually happen until, you know, basically the beginning of 1962. Mm -hmm. um, but one could argue, and I, I think pretty easily, that the, the, the foundation was being laid starting in 1960. Mm -hmm. really. So, um, you know, the, the United States, just like we, you know, I think we talked about it before, just like, you know, when the Korean War started, we were not ready for that, right? Mm -hmm. From an intelligence perspective, yeah. we're focused on Soviet Union. Yeah. Same thing. Same thing happens in, in Cuba, right? Uh, in 1960, there are um, the, you know the National Security Agency, the you know the organization that was predecessor to today's NSA, had five analysts who were looking at Cuba. Five, <laughs> right? United States Air Force had zero Spanish linguists in the inventory. Jeez, Absolutely. Right. Right, and I'll get to that you know a little bit as we as we kind of work our way through how we actually responded. Yeah. Um, but you know, so communism's the, the rage. You know, 
contain it, gotta, gotta stop it. So in 1960, when, when Castro declares, you know, that, that he is in fact running at what he called a socialist state, communist mm -hmm. state, um, things start, per, you know, three, our ears start per, perking up, right? Mm -hmm. Because before that, there was hope that maybe he's going to be on our side, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, sure. He had, he had been to the United States, he, you know, spent some time here, he, had, he came to the United Nations and, mm -hmm. before, and there was some hope that he was going to kind of be on our side. But you know, when when he declared, I think it was January 1960, so about a year after so he took over in, on January 1st, 1959, so in the Cuban Revolution, you know, actually, when he rolled into Havana. So it took about a year. And then when he finally declared, that, that sort of changed the American intelligence apparatus mindset for mm -hmm. you know, towards Cuba. It wasn't, wasn't a wait and see kind of thing anymore. So they got a lot more aggressive. Yeah. Um, so in September of that year, of 1960, um, and, and, you know, most people certainly don't know this, the, 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 uh, the Marines actually get credit for being the first, you know, folks to fly airborne ISR, airborne reconnaissance against, you know, against Cuba, against the Cuban Castro regime. Um, in September 1960, they started flying uh, Skynight EF-10Bs um, along the periphery of the island. And these were electronic intelligence collectors looking for radars. Right, because they wanted to start getting an idea of, um, you know, what the Cubans had, which, you know, indigenous Cuban stuff was going to be nothing, right? Yeah. But what they were looking for was, are the Russians, are the Soviets starting to give them arms and weapons and that type of stuff? So, uh, yeah, in September 1960, that's really when the first um, airborne ISR started flying, and that was that was Marines. I had no idea. Yeah, Marines started flying in the EF-10s. Um, and then in December, um, so that was all electronic intelligence looking for radars and, and other weapon systems. And then in December, they started flying um, imagery missions. So again, not over land, they're off, you know, they're off the coast. Um, but the RF-8A RF Crusader mm -hmm. was flying imagery missions, kind of doing the same thing. What are they, what are they putting along the coast? What kind of weapons are they, are they putting along there? Um, so that's kind of all happening airborne ISR-wise. Um, in October of 1960, um, the CIA starts flying U-2 missions, right? So a full two years before the actual, you know, crisis, right? The CIA is already, um, already flying. Um, they had a project called uh, Idealist. So Project Idealist was basically the cover, cover term, cover, you know, the program for all overflight. Uh, all U2 overflight, wherever it was. Mm -hmm. so part of Project Idealist, they started flying uh, really sporadically. I can't remember how many, but not not frequently, once a month maybe, um, flying over over the island. Um, that lasted for six, eight months or so. And then in 1961, the CIA stood up another program called Nimbus, Project Nimbus, which was um, specifically U2 aircraft flying over Cuba. So Idealist was kind of the cover for all, wherever they were. Um, in Nimbus, 1961, the CIA started directly flying. Directly with over. that, with that word, you know, increased um, increased missions over the island, and they also started. Um, you know, the U2 was famous for taking pictures. Yeah. Um, in 1961, they started putting an, an electronic intelligence, um, you know, collection capability on the plane mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So the U2 is flying over, taking pictures and collecting radar, you know, radar emanations from the mm -hmm. Soviet radars that are there. Um, in 1961, when they started doing that, that's when the picture started you know, coming together that, yeah, in fact, the Soviets had been shipping a lot of weapons and a lot of material to the island. Um, they started getting, you know, um, surface air missile radars were starting to be detected. Um, air defense, you know, AAA, mm -hmm. if you, you use a radar to track that stuff too. Um, and then uh, also air intercept radars. So, um, air know. intercept radar? Yeah. So, so the MiG 15s and the MiG 17s have a radar on them that they use to find air targets. Okay. Right. So, if, if the Cubans now have, you know, which at the time were fairly advanced fighters, right? MiG 15, MiG 17 were, you know, used in Vietnam so you know, these were pretty advanced at the time um, but we started collecting you know the, the air intercept radar off of those so that meant that 
you know, that the fighters now had the capability to find targets themselves and not necessarily be vectored in from the ground or whatever. Okay. Um, so that, you know, that increases the, the risk, right, to, to all those aircraft that are flying reconnaissance around and over the island. Now all of a sudden you got fighter aircraft that can find them and go and go take care of business. Um, so, so that's all happening, um, 61. Um, through all this time, the United States Air Force isn't doing much of anything, right? The, the, the eye is on Russia, right? So it's not until early 1962 um, that the Air Force actually gets serious about it, or somebody tells them to get serious about it. Right? So, so it was Marines, it was Marines and then CIA, but none yeah. of that was... I yeah, and there's, there's, yeah, there's some Navy, Navy stuff going on as well. Yeah, not until 1962. So basically, a full two years, you know, after after the you know the intelligence apparatus of the United States starts focusing its attention on Cuba, does does the United States Air Force get involved? I mean, there's a couple factors, right? Um, one, we didn't have very many SIGINT aircraft, mm -hmm. just a few, you know, and they're they are either in Europe or they're in the Pacific, watching that side of Russia. So they're you know they're spread out to both sides. Um, and then, like I mentioned before, there were no Spanish linguists. So the United States Air Force, no Spanish linguists at all. Um, that started changing, you know, in 1962. Um, the Marines flew, f f f did a mission, and there were, like, the, the increase in radars that they were collecting in this mission in 1962, I think it was January, um, was was so great that there was no way you could ignore it anymore. Okay, you know it was basically okay. A threshold has been crossed. Yes, right. This this is legit. The Russians are building up in in Cuba. It's not just hey, let's give Fid you know Fidelito a couple things. Yeah, right. So so the fear starts being that the Russians are going to deploy a crap load of Russian troops into Cuba. Okay, which they actually end up doing. There there ends up being about forty thousand Russian forces in Cuba. I didn't know that. Yeah, during this crisis. Well, and you know, those are those are guys that are training the Cubans, those are guys that yeah. are building the missile sites because the Cubans don't know how to do it. Right. Yeah. They, they just don't. Yeah. Um, and then but there are ground forces as well. And you know, there's a combat capability on the ground, a Russian combat capability on the ground. Um, so all that finally the Air Force, you know, kind of gets its gets its crap together, if you will, and decides that they need to um, get involved. Uh, so they send, um, they recall one of the C-132 Bravos, which was the, which was the, you know, for the Air Force at the time, and actually was a very capable sitting platform. Uh, so they bring one of those back from Europe, and then they start um, this crash program, basically, to find Spanish linguists. Okay. Right, so, um, you know, we got Russian linguists, we got Chinese, we got Korean linguists. Um, so the first thing they do is they go to Goodfellow Air Force Base, which is where we do all of our intelligence, you know, training. Um, even to this day, we still do it here, still do it there. Um, and they start scouring the, you know, the student population there. Okay, you know, Sanchez, Rodriguez, you know, trying to find guys who, you know, who were native Spanish speakers, yeah. but who were also intelligence professionals, so they could you know, not have to worry about training that part as well to teach him how to think, you know, think as an intelligence person would or whatever. Um, that is a successful program, right? Um, and, and I am fortunate enough to know a lot of those guys. So a bunch of the, the initial... Oh, guys? Yeah. Yeah, a bunch of the initial cadre of Spanish linguists are still with us. Um, and they, you know, we have a... You know, I used to be a Spanish linguist. So yeah. You know, I know a lot of these guys. We have reunions every year. We go to talk to them, and the, the stories they tell are just, they're just awesome. That's right? insane. So, yeah, yeah. So they, you know, they took them, took them out of Goodfellow, basically. Um, and, you know, one of my, one of my great friends and mentors, his name's you know, Segundo Espinosa, SB. Um, you know, he's in, he's in class at Goodfellow. One day, they pull him out, you know, they give him a, give him a little test, you know, if he can understand the Spanish and, you know, make him listen to a Cuban cut, that, you know, a Cuban you know, intelligence cut, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and then he's on a plane. They give him orders to, to go to, you know, to, to go down to the Keys, um, a place called Cujo Key, 
Um, and he gets there, and there's a bunch of other guys that they rounded up from around the Air Force, and they put them on the back of the C-130s, and they, they start doing it. You know, that's they start you, doing it. I was going to say, a lot. that's what you talked about in, in from Kites to Cold War, about the uh, the German speakers in World War II. A lot of it, and it kind of felt like, fucking give them some headphones, slap them on the plane. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, man, this is the exact same thing. It's, yeah. you know, they, they, they got as many intelligence guys as they could, but they also, you know, they also ended up grabbing cooks, supply dudes, maintenance guys, you know, whoever, whoever they could get that they thought had the competency or the, you know, the capacity to, to do the okay. intelligence mission. Okay. Um, so they all go down to, you know, they all end up down in, down in Cujo Key, which is, you know, down by Key West, basically. Um, and they start flying. I mean, they, they, they do what airmen do, you know, they, they just, they become really good at their job. Yeah. And it's, you know, airmen always surprise you, it's, you know, to this day, when you, when you let them, you know, do their thing, they'll always, you know, produce results. And that's exactly what happened. Yeah. You know? So they, they started, you know, they started flying and they started producing intelligence almost immediately. And, and, you know, because they're airmen, they're focused on air force kind of stuff and, you know, so they become experts on the air defense systems and you know what the surface to air missiles can do, the capabilities, how many people are there, all that kind of stuff. So it's you know it's a pretty cool success story at the end, mm-hmm. you know, right, for, for the Air Force because they're able to once again show that, you know, despite the fact that they were woefully underprepared, that they were able to, you know, bring an asset back, get some airmen to, to go do the mission get on the mission and start producing intelligence that, that you know, without a doubt helped you know, President Kenny kind of understand the overall situation. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, just adapt adaptability, just survive. Yeah. Yeah. Did it in yeah. World War II, did it in World War One. That's how you talk again, kites to cold in, uh, from kites to cold war. But yeah. Yeah. yeah and that's, you know, I mean, that is, thank you for that. Cause that's an underlying theme of the book. It right? is. Well, no, but really, yeah. Not just the plug. I mean, that is a thing is like, we always we look i know at least i do as a civilian i'm just like well that's just what they do it's it's the air force and they do the thing right and the cia does the thing but it's like a lot of this stuff starts as just like no one knows what's going on your hair's on fire with your pants around your ankles and then it's just like someone comes in just some just you know and they just drop the schlong on the table lemay kennedy and it's just like yo we gotta fix all this shit right now and it's yep. just a brutal crash course. It's what Commander Fravor, the naval pilot, says. It's it's a the Air Force is a self clean self cleaning oven. It's something brutal happens, but then it pops out on the other end. And next thing you know, you come out of World War II with Strategic Air Commander. Now you're going into you're coming out of sixty two with, you know, an effective program for ISR and airborne radar and correct? Yeah, right. You know, and I mean, the, you know, the, the story, of course, doesn't end, right? It, yeah. it shows the Air Force, you know, the, the, the United States Air Force Security Service, which is, you know, the intel service, basically, for the Air Force at the time, um, that, that there's more to, more to, you know, the world's geopolitical problems than the Soviet Union. Yeah. And really, from, from that time um, till, you know, till now, there's a, a lot more capable you know there's there's a wider expanse of capability you don't you know you don't shut down after these things are over so Mm -hmm. you know the spanish linguist capability remains after cuba it doesn't Mm -hmm. okay we're done you know everything's over 12 days 17 days whatever it was you know everything's done go back to go back to being a cook yeah so they figure out that hey you know we got to have some some capability in the hopper whenever these things happen yeah i think you know throughout the 60s throughout the 70s that's you know that that remains and it helps us out a lot because we're not as you know we're not caught off we're not caught off guard as much as we were when you know particularly when the korean war and the cuban missile crisis started we were just zero capability yeah yeah vietnam we could talk about a little bit you know the good thing good thing for air force isr with, with vietnam is it was such a slow buildup that it wasn't just a you know it wasn't an overnight kind of requirement you know? yeah you could tell in the early '60s that something was going to happen in Vietnam. And, yeah, you know the Air Force was able to kind of keep pace and not be caught, you know, so far off guard like they were in the early. So let's wrap up the story of, Air, of Airborne ISR, right? So um, spring of '62, I think that's kind of where we are, right? We got the Air Force flying finally. The other services are flying. CIA's flying. Um, 
in spring of 62, the U-2 is flying multiple missions a week over the island at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and they detect the SA-2 missile. Mm -hmm. Right, and it hadn't they hadn't seen that before. So if you remember, the SA two is the missile that shot down Gary Powers. Yeah, right. So obviously that's a that's a thing, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's going to scare people. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and I think the the point I wanted to make, you know, is, is even though they identified that on the island are SA two missiles, the urgency of what was going on, and this is spring of sixty two, right? So this is before you know, the, the famous nuclear pictures come out and all that kind of stuff. Um, the urgency of what's going on on the island is such that they keep flying anyway. Yeah. Right. So, you know, right. They, they know that, you know, they know that the, the Soviets have put the SA-2 missile in Cuba, that it's operational, um, and then it has shot down a U-2 before, yeah, right? Yeah. But yeah. they keep flying anyway. So I think that kind of just underlines how, how important, you know, at least the administration thought things were um, on the island at the time. And, you know, those flights continued until basically the end of the, you know, the end of the thing. Um, even after, you know, on October 27th, I think it was, you know, a U-2 was shot down. Right? Tag another one, yeah. <laughs> right, so they tag another one. Uh, that's, you know, Rudolph Anderson is flying that one. And he gets shot down, but they don't stop. Yeah. Right? When Gary Powers got shot down in 1960, everything came to a halt, yeah. right? No more overflights. They even slowed down the, you know, the, 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 you know, the collection that was going on off the periphery, off the, you know, off the coast of the countries. Um, that's not the case with this one. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's full steam ahead. Yeah, we lost the U2, but this is so important that we, we have to keep doing this. Right. So, um, and, you know, so that was 27 October, but I, the, you know, the, the, flight where they got the pictures of the missile sites was on 14 October. So kind of putting all that together, right? You know, they had two weeks before, not even two weeks before, they had collected imagery that showed them that the Russians were, were installing nuclear, you know, at least nuclear sites. I don't think they knew at the time that the missiles were actually in place, um, which come to find out later they were, and they were in fact operational. Yeah. Right? Which, okay, that's kind of scary. Yeah. Right? Um, so yeah, I think that, you know, that kind of ties all of the airborne ISR stuff, you know, that was going on. Of course, there's so much more you can talk about, right? But, you know, the, the Navy and the Marines are flying, you know, low level fighter aircraft over the island, buzzing the sites, getting, you know, taking pictures as close to the sites as they possibly could. You know, I don't know if you've watched the movie, but the, that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the the uh, those fighter pilots that were buzzing the sites that actually happened. You know, Pepper, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So you know, just a just a whole bunch of brave guys, yeah. you know, doing what they needed to do because, like we said before, you know, they thought that the world was was in the balance. Yeah, and again, you're 17 out, 17 years out of World War II. Yeah, a lot of them like remember it. They're like, yeah. hey, it could come right back. Yeah, and you know you. You find out the Russians have nuclear w weapons that could reach Washington, New York City, right? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a thing, and, it, and there's no warning. It's super yeah. close. Yeah, right? yeah. So, yeah. So, so that whole situation, you know, most people think of airborne ISR and the Cuban Missile Crisis, and all they think of is the U two because that's mm -hmm. what they that's what they know. Hey, we flew a U two over and it found these missile sites, which is true, right? Yeah. But for two years plus before that, we were conducting airborne ISR against the Cubans and throughout the whole time we were also doing, you know, doing more collections. So yeah. It's pretty robust, pretty robust thing. I'm gonna I'm gonna put all this together and write an article, you know, to kind of capture it all. Probably probably try to publish it, you know, to coincide with the sixtieth anniversary. I think that'd be, you know, that'd be kind cool. of cool. So not next year but the year after. Yeah. Yeah. That'll give me time to, to hopefully COVID will go away. I can actually go to the archives and do some research. And, God you know, willing. Right? <laughs> All that stuff. So, yeah. yeah. What questions do you have? Yeah. Well, I was going to say is, so well, I was going to bring up the movie 13 Days. I was going to say, is that accurate? Uh, well, it, yeah. I, I mean, mean, that the piece that I mentioned. Yes. Yeah, sure. I know it's, it's yeah, for obviously sure. Hollywoodized. Right? Yeah, it's, it's, you know, sensationalized a little yeah. bit. But the, I mean, the, the good thing is the tapes are out there, right? Yeah. I mean, you can read, you can read the transcripts, and you can actually listen to the audio. 
Yeah. Which is insane. Right. Listen to the tape from the Oval Off or the situation, whatever. You can listen to Kennedy and the top dogs talking about yeah. nukes on Cuba. Right. That's insane. Yeah. You can you can listen to the tapes, you can read all of the intelligence reports that were coming out. So you can, you know, for a historian, you can you can tell a pretty good story, you know, put it all together and, and do a do a fairly decent, you know, accurate job of, you know, laying out what actually happened. Which is pretty cool. The movie sensationalized a little bit, but there, there, a lot of it's, a lot of it's spot on. A lot of yeah. it's really good. It's. It doesn't the pilot say like, like, did you get shot at? And he was like, no, I must have hit some birds. Yeah. And they're like, you hit some twenty millimeter birds, and he's like, apparently, <laughs> right? <laughs> no, yeah. that that probably didn't happen. I mean, like, no. yeah. right? I don't know, man, with Lemay, he, I could see Lemay being like. Yeah, you got shot. No, we got hit by birds. And LeMay's, I mean, literally right there. Like, you're telling me you didn't get shot. Like, LeMay is just itching. It just, he's like, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. It, Must have. Let's go get him. He's just like, yeah, I could see LeMay just fucking furious. Yeah. Right? But it's, there's some, you know, Raven Rock by Garrett Graff. There's actually one of, uh, like, a cool story from that that I always, I never knew until like last summer. But uh, it's, I forget who it was. It was someone that was, or maybe it was deputy secretary. He was someone that was in the Senate. And he was someone high up and close to Kennedy. I can't for the life of me remember what made him. He was, it wasn't just that he was a senator. It's, I don't remember what, but he was somehow vital to like national defense. Okay. Kennedy. And uh, so when this, when they found out this was happening, but they're still trying to like keep it like low key. Yeah. He was on vacation, or or the Senate was on recess, or whatever. He was down in the Gulf of Mexico fishing, right? Going back to see the constituents, maybe schmooze with some donors, whatever, just doing whatever these guys do, right? But he's out in the in the Gulf of Mexico. A marine helicopter comes, and the way they describe it is it's it's thundering over the horizon, blowing up the rotor wash, and they see it, and they're like, "What the hell is that?" I shit you not, they throw down like you know they say a bottle it was something something floating and it says uh it says like climb aboard and they so they drop like a ladder so the guy's just like but it doesn't even say what it is in case that someone down there is for whatever cold war paranoia somehow linked to the soviets they just say like we need the senator to come aboard so they drop down this thing right so the senator goes up the the helicopter then so they get on they say uh you need to be in washington now they fly to an, this is all true. They fly to an oil rig, put them on a faster helicopter. That flies back onto mainland United States. They put him in the back of a fighter jet. What? I swear to God, this isn't wow. Ra- Raven Rock. This guy, Eric Graff, is, he's a professor at Georgetown, he used to work for Politico. His book was the best selling book on Audible in 2019. So this isn't some like, you know, and then the yeah. aliens came. No, right. it's like, I, I remember my jaw was on the floor. They put him wow. in the back wow. of a fighter jet and hightail to D.C. to show him the pictures taken. What's it called? Raven Rock by Garrett Graff. G-A- Garrett Graff. G- G-R-A-F-F. It's all, Raven Rock is one of the uh, the nuclear bunkers. Sidar, uh, NORAD, Mount yeah. Weather. Yeah, yeah. It's all Got about, it. it's a history of that, but his Cuban Missile Crisis chapter. Yeah, that's fantastic. cool. That's I'll check it out. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. It's, it's insane. But yeah, that's how it starts. It's like, they come back and he's, he's just like, what the hell is going on? And like, they paint the imagery. They come in and like Kennedy's got like the pictures on the table and just like shows it to him. And this guy's just like, oh my fucking God. Yeah. Like, so like that, like that's not cinematic. That's what happens. Yeah. It's, that's awesome. Yeah. It, it, it paint, puts it all into perspective. But, um, can you imagine now? I mean, you, you know, you got to think, right? One, yeah. one of the, one of the greatest things about our country is where we are. Yes. Oh my god! Oh my god! Right. I mean, it is at the time. Right now, yeah. now we've been under threat from nuclear attack forever. But at yeah. the time, you know, you're this is a safe place. Yeah, you know, Mexico ain't invading you. Yeah, and Canada's right. not invading you. This, this, yeah, this is right? a safe place to be. And then from from one day to the next, all of a sudden that's gone. Yeah, you have to really think of that. Yeah, that's been there forever. It's just we're separated. By, I mean, even Pearl Harbor. Yeah. was Hawaii. It wasn't LA, right? Yeah. I mean, we knew there were some U-boats off the coast, but I mean, okay, yeah. whatever. Cool little tin can, whatever, you know? Yeah, yeah you're right. You got to come through Mexico or over the North Pole. No, you're not doing that. 
And then just like that. Just like that, there's nuclear weapons 90 miles from yeah. deep west. I mean, I imagine it, it's the same feeling as, you know, obviously you can look at Pearl Harbor and go, that must have felt like 9-11, right? I remember I was 11 years old on 9-11, but I generally, you know, remember the feeling. Yeah. But I would say the Cuban Missile Crisis is probably pretty similar to it, the sense of vulner vulnerability. Twin Towers is, okay, a second plane hit, oh my God. But then it's like they hit the Pentagon. Then it's like, what the hell is going on, right? We're invincible. It's, yeah. I imagine it was that, that feeling, right? It felt a lot. Yeah, I hadn't really thought about it like that. But it probably felt a lot like that. Yeah. You know, that day, you know, obviously I'm older than you. And I was, I was at work on that day. And you, yeah. That, that you just had this sinking feeling in your gut. You know, that, it's holy here. crap, this is this has actually come to you know, it's it's come home. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's not the are, not a movie not, trailer. Yeah, yeah, we're not safe here. I mean, it, you know, attacks had happened. They had, you know, ninety three. They, they had hit the World Trade Center already. Mm -hmm. You know, the domestic stuff, but nothing on that scale. No. You know, nothing on that scale. And yeah, you know, I, I, I bet, especially for the people in the know, you know, that that was, yeah, that was one of those kind of moments where, holy yeah. crap, you know, yeah. the, the Russians can kill us. Right now, if they want to. Yeah. What was, I think the, the estimate they did was the missiles, the missiles on Cuba, I think they said 1600 seconds. Yeah. That's the, that was the math they did, 1600 seconds from Cuba to DC. Yeah. Which is insane. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you got to think because it's not, it's not like that's some like Fox or CNN fear mongering, right? Imagine yeah. being, imagine the helicopter coming, you're a senator. Yeah. And you're like, who are these? Do, do they know who the fuck I am? <laughs> and, they, and they take you to an oil rig. Like, oh, I'm a senator. You're taking me to an oil rig? And then they bring you to an air base with just some poor schmuck that's like, get in the back, put on the oxygen. Right. Warn it. You probably got some fat senator just like. Try not to puke. There. Yeah, try not to puke. With, you know, yeah. what the hell is going on? That's crazy. Like, yeah, I never heard of that story. Yeah, it's insane. I don't know. I I've tried to get Garrett Graff to come on this podcast so many times and he said yes so many times and then ghosted me. So I've stopped trying. Garrett, if you're listening, I doubt you are. Please come on and talk to me and Tyler. <laughs> but that's a cool story. I want to hear it. You get, but you got to think about, yeah, what, the, what I was getting to is in the know, like you're saying, it's not fear mongering. This whole thing happens and it's, you know, and then it's Kennedy saying, you know, you can almost see the imagery, right? Just turn, you know, turning the picture out of his fingers and like sliding it across the table. Yeah. And being like, oh, fuck. Yeah, right. that, that moment where they all find out that this is real and it's, and it's right there, and and even now, like, like what you said, well, you know, well now we're under constant nuclear threat. Yeah, but with that again, with them, it's 17 years removed where it wasn't just a threat; it was we use it twice. In yeah, yeah, absolutely, right? Yeah, it's you like, didn't, you didn't know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you knew everybody had a, you know. I'm not going to start a nuclear war kind of policy, right? But yeah. did you really know? Yeah, it was 17 years in the rearview mirror. Yeah. It was closer to them than 9 11 is to us. Of course, yeah. It's yeah. right there, right? It's, it's the yeah. invasion to, of Iraq to now. It's, yeah. like, it's like if right now we were like building up on Iran's border and everyone, you know, future historians could, would look back at it and go, you got to remember, these guys were 17 years removed from invading two countries. <laughs> Yeah. Nothing's off the table, right? So it's that same we're seventeen years removed from eighty five million dead, the shattering of the world, complete change in global balance of power, yeah. and then dropping two nuclear bombs on the sovereign nation of Japan. That's yeah. right there. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't out of the realm of the possible for sure. And yeah. the you know, the, the people who are leading the military and you know, the government to some extent were were in the war. Yeah. Right? Yeah, absolutely. So that, was, that was, you know, that was how they made their mark for the most part. I mean, you know? who the hell is, as we were saying, I know you got to go, but who the hell, I mean, think LeMay. Like, we're talking now, you know, with the, the recordings of him in, in the Oval Office, but it's like, he's literally the guy that was like the head bomber in World War II. So <laughs> exactly. not only is it in the rearview mirror, he's, he remembers it. Right. And, he, and he's ready to, to put that face yeah. back on if he needs to. Yeah. It, uh, probably a little more ready than he should have been. <laughs> probably a little more eager than he should have been, right? It's hey, I love him. I'm not I'm not hating, but I mean I think Kennedy said LeMay is not the one you want choosing the shots about the battle, but he is the one you want leading you into the battle. Absolutely. I mean he was a Rottweiler. I mean let's just oh, he was. He, I love him. I'm not shitting on him, but I mean probably no. a little too little too antsy for it. But uh No, he is he was the airman that the United States needed 
yes. is more. Yes. We needed, we needed that kind of guy to, to be ruthless and to do what had to be done. Yes. You want, yeah, you don't want an attack dog that you have to wake up. You want a grizzly bear that you have to actively pull down. He was born for that. That's, I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, Rich, Richard Rhodes says in The Dark Sun, he quotes LeMay, who said, I will never forget how unprepared we were after Pearl Harbor. I will never forget at, when our current rate of loss of, what was it, B-17s or B-29s? What, what was the one we had right at the beginning, right when we went into Europe? B-17s. He goes, I will never forget how unprepared we were. And with the B-17s we had, and at the rate we were losing them, he used very, a very simple equation, and the rate that we were replenishing them, factor it all together, we had 30 days left of an Air Force. And it's, I mean, now we know World War II and the American war machine and what FDR put into, you know, and we know. But at the time, again, you have to look at it then. He goes, I will never forget how unprepared we were, and that will never yeah. happen again. So, again, you get, you got that guy now. Yeah. Who, in 1943, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a certain outcome. Yeah, not at all. Eighth Air Force was taking an ass whooping yeah. over the skies of Europe. I mean, that yeah. was, it was rough. Yeah. You know, it was rough. Yeah. So, and he, and that is why he, you know, he ran strategic air command with an iron fist and, yes. and refused for them not to be prepared. I mean, yeah. I mean, the fucking logo. <laughs> Literally, is an iron fist. <laughs> right. Yes. It is, yeah. It's, I mean, yeah. yeah, dude. He went. I, I could go on Lemay for hours. Um, yeah. I know you said you had forty-five minutes. I've kept. Yeah. Going. All good, man. Hey, that was awesome. Dude, that was awesome. We. I think we need a. I think we need to do a part two. That was wasn't enough. But um, I'll leave that. I'll leave the ball in your court. You get back to me on that. All right, man. All right, my man. Thank you so much, Tyler Morton, Colonel Tyler Morton, PhD from Kites to Cold War, Bill Bond. What? Good stuff. Oh, I, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say available on Amazon and Kindle. Fucking oh, yeah. it. It's brilliant. And like I said in the first time we talked, it's actually kind of funny. I think those in a world war or the very beginning of like hot air balloons and shit, you know, a, a cannon going over his head and then turning around and, like Viva la France and a middle finger. And, like the original <laughs> Top Gun, like cop right. fighter. Absolutely. It goes back to powdered wigs and using leeches to cure cancer. Yeah. But, I'm going to go off on a tangent and I got to let you go. So Tyler, thank you very much for coming on and uh, next time, bro. Stay safe. God bless. Thank you. See you later, brother.